You all right? We are recording, yes. All right. How the hell do we do this again? <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Popon Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me as always is... Steve Galindo, Reverend and Church of... Uh, Pope of Pope of the Church of Ed Wood. So, how the hell are you, Steve? <laughs> Pretty good, pretty good. We missed a couple of episodes, unfortunately, because I did land in the hospital. Did so, you like almost? Let's just let's just jump right to this. Did you almost die or something? Not sure. Not sure if I almost died or not. Not sure. Uh, I developed an abscess. I had a hell of an infection. There has been and still is actually a, a good deal of poison going through my system. Um. Poison. And that's about it. Yeah. Puss and crap. You know. Ugh. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's been it's been a wonderful, wonderful time. Okay. Now um follow up question. Uh was did it have anything to do with ISIS? Uh it may have to have done something with ISIS because there have been a couple of people from ISIS hanging around inside of my apartment. I don't know why. Uh okay. but they've been eating all the Cheez Its. Uh not really happy about that. So there might be some ISIS involvement. Okay. Follow up question, only in slightly related to the last question. Um it is President Obama somehow responsible for this oh i'm sure he's somehow responsible i just haven't made that connection yet okay uh somehow this has got to tie back to the bilderberg group and then exactly. to obama is what i'm thinking i think it's going to take two two hops to get to him see i'm a parent so at the at, i thought you said the build a bear group <laughs> and i'm like how does build a bear fit into this but no okay Okay, I see what you're saying. Wouldn't it be awesome if it did, though? Yeah, if it was somehow related to the Build a Bear group, like <laughs> yeah. Build a Bear is is causing like it, I'm. You know what I'm thinking of now? I'm thinking of Halloween. Halloween three was that the one that was in no way related to the rest of the Halloween movies? Yes, season of the that, witch. Yeah, that was the one with the the Halloween masks. That's what I'm thinking. That somehow, if you if you get a build a bear, then it poisons you, just like that movie. Have what? you purchased a build a bear recently? <laughs> I I think build a bear would be a perfect perfect place to store and hide microfilm. Ooh, that's a good Ooh. point. Which so they don't use it in spy movies movies very much anymore. You know, microfilm. So probably. yeah. Probably. It, I imagine the, you know, it's all cell phones now. But yeah. using a cell phone isn't the same, you know, for spy movies. Speaking of spy movies, I just recently saw the film uh, Kingsman. Kingsman. Saw, um, yeah. Sounds it, familiar, but I can't place it offhand. Uh, it's a spy movie, almost parody, very British it's based on a graphic novel it, it, it it's quite good it, at times it it's almost like a like a parody of spy movies it's uh -huh. really quite good the best part about it is that the bad guy is played with played by Samuel L. Jackson and he does the whole thing in a lisp i imagine really? okay i imagine he does it just because he can cuz he's Samuel L. Jackson yeah but it really is uh, quite a good movie it's like hideously graphically violent and just, you know, as long as you don't think too hard about the film, then it really is a whole bunch of fun. <laughs> but now is it supposed to be a parody or? Kind of. At times they, they, they literally, there are times in the spy movie where they're literally talking about their favorite spy movies. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. That's like sort of a running gag through the whole thing. It really is. A uh, sort of a modern take on a on a James Bond sort of thing, but with a lot of British class warfare. It's quite an interesting movie. It's definitely worth like the, you know, a ticket and a bucket of popcorn. It's quite interesting. Yeah. I was surprised by it. 
Cool. I don't, I don't go to the movies a lot nowadays, but that one I went and I saw it, and it was it, it was pretty damn good. I have not seen anything of note recently. Uh, AMC was running Jurassic Park pretty much on a continuous loop the whole time I was in the hospital. So I saw that 10 or 15 times. What did you think of the other ones? Uh, did not see the other ones. You didn't see the other ones? Still have only seen just the first Jurassic Park. That is surprising. And I mean, the, the Jurassic... Not really, the, not really missing anything, but still, <laughs> that's surprising. The Jurassic Park thrill has kind of worn off of me since it first came out. When it yep. first came out, it was like, oh, cool, dinosaurs. And then after that, it's like, there's not really much of a story going on here at all. You know? No. Not to mention the fact that there are about a million different mistakes throughout the whole movie. Yeah. That just drive me absolutely nuts. Like, the one that really drives me nuts, that just re just it pisses me off. Okay, so they're, it's near the end, and they're up in the ceiling trying to escape the uh, raptors who have come into the computer area there. Yeah. And uh, you see the people, and they're slowly climbing. But then suddenly, the red-headed, annoying little girl gets lifted up because there's a raptor. Mm -hmm. A raptor's head has lifted her up, but then uh, <laughs> somebody kicks the raptor, and the raptor falls about 20 feet. So how did the raptor get up there in the first place to lift her up in the ceiling? Do you see what I'm saying? That is a good point. I personally wanted to see Laura Dern in more poop, but that's yeah. a different show. I was... That was one of those movies where I really thought, okay, well, hopefully these kids will die. Yeah. <laughs> they never died. It no. really upset me. That was one of the first times. Like, I've said that a million times about a million different characters, but that was one of the first times that um, I really wanted children to die. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so glad you're feeling better. You scared me there for a second. Uh, it was all pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I don't do, and I don't do urgent care and things like that. You know? So if, if that's what I'm doing, if I'm being rushed around in ambulances, things have gotten pretty serious. Yeah. And the, the pain levels were wonderfully intense. And now I know exactly what I'll smell like when I'm dead. Oh, that's nice. Oh yeah. Oh my God. The smell was rancid. Really? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I, I still hate hospitals and I still hate doctors. The, oh, this was this was one of the best parts. Okay. Okay. So they um they're pumping in intravenous antibiotics to try okay. to get this thing taken care of. Okay? Yeah. Now every time the nurse comes in, which is four times a day, okay? Okay. They're trying to give me stool softeners. Ooh. And I'm like, okay, I have diarrhea because of this, okay? Stool softeners are not going to be a good idea. And they keep, they keep offering them. They keep bringing them in saying, oh, and we have the stool softeners. And I'm like, I don't need the stool softeners. Can we possibly get this taken off of the record? And they, they say, no, because you're supposed to be con constipated. <laughs> so you need the stool softeners. Yeah, no. So now every time they could check off, patient refused, patient refused, patient refused. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, you got a bad record there of patient refuses. Yeah. Uh, maybe you want to take that I have diarrhea seriously and maybe do something about that? <laughs> I haven't really gotten any major sickness in my life. Uh, although once I had a staph infection, but uh, nobody had told me what a staph infection was, so I didn't know that it was serious when I had it. Yeah. Like, I, I just go to the doctor. I had this, this 
bump on my leg and it was kind of itchy. And then the next day it had blown up to like golf ball size. So we're like, maybe we should go and check that out. And by the time we're at the doctor, it's like baseball size, like really big, huge, massive thing on the back of my leg. And that's doctor- basically what this is, except this would be the size of your open hand. Ugh, okay. You so know, the doctor, so the doctor just says, "Okay, well, this is a staph infection. We need to remove it now." So, like five minutes later, a nurse comes in and gives me some uh, painkillers. Right. But then apparently they didn't wait for them to kick in because about ten minutes after that, they were digging a hole into my leg. Mm-hmm. Um, was not fun. <laughs> not fun. No. No, not fun at all. So happy that you're that you're feeling good and you're feeling better and now we can get back to the show and How yay. many how many did we miss though? One or two? I I think two. Yeah. Maybe three, I don't know. I don't know. Cuz I was kind of like not really there for a while. Yeah. So I've I've sort of lost track of whether it was one or two. And but, but here we go again. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I, I wanted to um, start this episode off a little bit differently. If possible, I wanted to start this episode of the podcast off with a big group prayer. Okay. Okay. So if you're listening, please bow your heads in uh, solemn uh, reverence and pray to whatever deity or evil being or Joe Pesci you see fit. <laughs> um, uh, dear Lord, baby Jesus. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to start with a prayer because um, the Sklar brothers, Randy and Jason, the people who created Cheap Seats, yes. my favorite TV show of all time, which was uh, a bit of our homework in a previous episode, they have recently, I follow them on Twitter and I follow them on um, Facebook, and they recently announced that they uh, have taped a pilot for a new sports show for Comedy Central. Nice. And I am really, really such a huge fan, such a vocal supporter of... Cheap Seats without Ron Parker. It's just such a wonderful show, and it's all free on YouTube, and it's the funniest show that no one in the world has seen, and I love it so much (laughs) that I just felt that, you know, I really want this to happen. So if we could all just just bow our heads for a second and just pray, dear Lord God, make Comedy Central pick up this show. Because that would be awesome. And I would consider it a personal favor. Um, and hey, maybe uh, I can owe you, God. I don't know. You want somebody, like, rubbed out or something? You know, I can do that for you. Because <laughs> I will owe you a favor after this. And um, so, God, if you could please make this happen, I will gladly build or destroy any churches you want. I was going to say that I would build a church in God's name, but it, God's probably not into that. So I can also destroy any church that you might need, God, in your name. And also, you know, while we're, while we're praying, um, hey, Satan, you know, if God can't do it, maybe you could work some of your magic and make this show happen. I want to cover both of the bases, you know? <laughs> Not just God, but uh should pray to everybody. If Satan does do it, there's going to be more boobs in it. That's, you know, there, there wouldn't be a problem there. <laughs> I wouldn't have a problem there. Dear uh, Tom Cruise, if you could use your Scientology powers... To make this show happen, that would be awesome. As far as I know, uh, Randy and Jason have never said anything bad about Scientology on any of their stand-up specials or anything like that. So if you could please make that happen, 
that would be wonderful. Um, in your name, Tom Cruise, we pray, amen. And see, amen. there you go. I just started our show with a prayer. <laughs> I think that's pretty awesome. Oh, by the way, um, I am currently busy uh, cutting stickers for story time. So if you hear a noise that sounds like scissors, it's me cutting stickers for the kids for story time while we're doing this. I just wanted to clarify, just in case you start hearing like, can you hear that? I can hear that. Fair enough. Okay. So just letting you know if you hear these weird noises and you're like, hey, what the hell is going on there? I'm just cutting <laughs> Spider-Man stickers. All right. Just wanted to clarify that. And how is story time going? Um, It's doing pretty good. It, I feel weird about story time, and I feel weird about story time because I, I started doing story time in Arizona, which is where I was first hired. And it, they they don't really tell you how to do it. They just say, okay, you need to read this book, and then there you go, the end. So I started off very much as like a cheesy storyteller that's sort of like, okay, kids, put your listening ears on. Uh huh. Everybody sit quietly. We're going to read this book. And then I, I started doing story time. They forced me to do story time in California, and I really didn't like it. And I was trying to be a good storyteller, but the kids were just way too hyper. And so I made a conscious effort to – I I I thought, what if I made my, myself as hyper as the kids were? Maybe they would pay attention. And so I started just getting more crazy and hyperactive and interactive. And my story times got a lot weirder. Mm -hmm. And eventually, by the time I left, I would be getting like 30 or 40 or 50 kids showing up for every story time. And they were really weird and out there and bizarre and, and just absolutely crazy. But the kids really liked it. Like they, they got used to my strangeness. Yeah. So I feel weird because now here I am in the Midwest and I'm starting out strange. It's not like in California where I slowly grew my strangeness levels to a to the point where I was. No, I'm starting off really really weird. And how are all the little oaky children cotton cottoning to it? The the kids seem to like it. Every once in a while, I get an adult that's just really weirded out by the fact that, like like the other day, I, I said, kids, you know, I've got these books for you that I'm supposed to read, but, you know, you, these are kind of babyish books. I don't think that you kids, you know, this is this is too young for you. You kids want something a bit older, something a bit more challenging. So I'm going to be reading this book to you. It's called American Sniper. Okay. <laughs> and it's it's about an American hero. It's a bit of a long book. It's going to take about three days to read. So please get comfy. And I, I, I start reading the books. And the kids are just like booing and, and doing stuff like that. And the parents are just shocked, you know? <laughs> it It... I'm starting off really bizarre with these kids, and sometimes I feel really bad for them. You know, because they're, they're not getting a chance to get used to how weird I am. I'm just diving just straight into the deep end of the pool here. Yeah. And the kids like it, but the kids aren't the ones who have to, like, wake up and drive to come to my story times, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm getting a bunch of... Kids coming to the story times, and I'm getting some good press, and I'm in some like local newspapers and magazines and nice. stuff, and that's all really good. And I, I've become a meetup place for a like this big group of of local area moms, and they they pick different things every weekend to go to. So I'm I'm like the hot thing for some local area moms to come and see, and that's that's all fine and dandy but sometimes i just see what i'm doing like i'm outside of my body and looking at my story times and i'm like oh man this is really weird this is like really bizarre but 
It, as long as the kids like it, then I'm trying to be okay with it, you know? Right. Uh, I'm I'm a bit scared about next, uh, tomorrow. I have a story time tomorrow, and I'm a bit scared about it because it's supposed to be uh, Black History Month story time. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I, that's too serious for me, you know? Yeah. Like, wh- how am I supposed to make this weird? How am I supposed to crack jokes during Black History Month story time? It I, is kind of hard to lighten that mood. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, kids, today we're going to learn about racism. <laughs> but it's going to be super fun. <laughs> it's, it's, um, I'm not exactly sure what to do. Uh, we are being hit with uh, kind of a mini snowmageddon yeah. so here in Oklahoma. So there's a possibility that my story time might be snowed out. And there's a part of me that is sadly kind of ex- excited for that. Mm-hmm. Because I'm just, I, I don't know how I can make this one fun and weird without offending people. You know? Yeah. I felt the same way when I had to do a special... Um, Hanukkah story time. Like I'm, I'm so worried I'm gonna say something wrong. Yeah, I never do, but still, I'm really worried about it. Like, how do I, how do I make Black History Month silly? Well, how did the Hanukkah one go? Oh, I was, I was literally sick that day. Ah, okay. I didn't call in because I was scared of doing the story time. I had a huge, massive stomach virus and was vomiting all over the place. So I didn't get to do it, which was kind of a secret blessing. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't know how to cheer that one up to either. Yeah. I think if I have to do the Black History Month story time, I may just end up reading books by f- famous black authors. I'm supposed to read this book about the the life of Jackie Robinson, but it's pretty heavy on the racism that he had to deal with, and it's just I don't want to do that to the kids. Mm-hmm. It's like the last thing I want to do during a family friendly story time is explain why there were two different drinking fountains. Right. You know, it's like what the hell am I? Sp- how am I supposed to do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. That is pretty heavy for a story time. Yeah, the the corporation is now realizing that story times are, you know, bring people, bring butts into the seats. Right. So they're scheduling a lot of story times for me. Over the last decade, story time has been optional. So I've been able to do whatever story times I want. Like, okay, today's going to be mustache story time. Next week, we're going to have... Um, Babies dressed as animals story time, like really weird, bizarre things. Like uh, I, I had a story time where I wrestled a gang of angry bears. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and stuff like that. I would make up all these weird, silly story times. But now that the corporation realizes that story times are successful, pretty much all of the story times are now scheduled for me. So it, this Black History Month story time is when I have to do and I have to read this one book. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. I do not even have a good idea for you. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's a rough ticket, but uh, yeah, I'll figure it out. So, 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 so. Do you remember what movie we're supposed to be watching? We talk- are doing Frankenstein and The Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, oh, I want to mention this now. I'm not going to talk about it because I'm going to save that for when we get to Bride of Frankenstein, but I want to mention this now. If you're going to pull anything and put it at the beginning of the podcast, I want you to pull my favorite line from any Frankenstein movie ever. Okay. It's not, um, uh, it's alive because I think that's overdone. My favorite line in the history of Frankenstein movies. I've recorded it, and it's a ringtone on my phone, and it's a song. This tiny little 
bit of dialogue is a is a song that appears now on my phone and it's on my computer it's everywhere and i've talked at length to the kids about it my kids know about my obsession with this one line but it's the end of bride of frankenstein and frankenstein it, the the monster's all upset because he's been rejected and he leans his arm like all cool yeah on a lever and Dr. Frankenstein says what I consider to be one of the best lines in the history of mankind, in the history of cinema. He says, look out, the lever. (laughs) And I love that so much. (laughs) The lever. I thought maybe you were going for, where's the salt and pepper? We do not have salt and pepper. (laughs) No, no. The Leva! The Leva! Yeah. I absolutely love the Leva! It's just the, the my favorite line. I'm, I'm not going to talk about it anymore because I want to save it for when we get to that part. Okay. But I had a hard time like trying to, to, to wrap my head around like do, us doing Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein in the podcast because if you do Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein you really have to talk about universal pictures and universal studios yeah uh-huh horror movies i mean i mean that's that's a big ticket you know yeah i watched uh i watched frankenstein uh i rewatched it for like the bajillionth time i watched it with maxwell my uh-huh. son, and he is three, and he really liked the movie. He really just thought it was spooky and scary, and he was actually scared of it, like I imagine people in 1931 were scared of the movie. Really? Nice. Yeah, yeah, he, he thought it was spooky and scary, and, you know, not just the monster. When the monster, you know, when he first really saw the monster, he screamed a little bit, but... Just the spooky, atmospheric, gothic sort of look of the whole thing. He just thought was so scary that he was so excited. But I thought it was really interesting at the end when you finally got to the the scene where uh, Frank, the monster, I keep wanting to call the monster Frankenstein like so many other people have done. I, I, I personally am in favor of that. The monster is Frankenstein. Yeah. I, I saying, oh, but, you know, F- Frankenstein is the name of the doctor and the monster is not named Frankenstein, so you shouldn't call it. I always felt that that was a, an argument for hipsters. Basically, yes. It's a very pretentious, very, very, it's very much in line of, oh, it's not Godzilla, it's Gojira. Yeah. It's, it's very much in that kind of a vein, like, you pretentious bastard. Yeah. It's Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. So when we got to the scene where um, Maxwell liked the movie, he was playing with his toys and also watching the movie. He liked it, like, fine enough. But he, Maxwell got so excited when we got to the part where Frankenstein's monster is playing with the little girl by the lake. Oh, yes. Oh, uh-huh. man, he got so excited. He's like, Daddy, look. Daddy, look. They friends <laughs> is what is Daddy, what he said. He said, "Daddy, look, they friends, they friends," and I'm like, "Oh Daddy, crap! You have no idea what's coming." Daddy, you mm-hmm. got this? No, Maxwell. These stickers are for story time. I'll let you have some of them. He got so excited because it's like, "Oh look, there's a kid and fr- the monsters playing with the kid. It's a uh-huh. little girl. Oh, how wonderful!" I'm sure that this won't end badly at all because they're just <laughs> friends. And I'm like, let me put my arm around you, Maxwell, because something's about to happen and you may or may not be scarred for life. Um, Scientologists call that an engram. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Maxwell got an engram from this scene because he's like, Daddy, look, they friends. And then Frank and the monster. Ah, God damn it, I'm going to be doing this the whole freaking podcast. So the monster runs out of flower petals and picks up the girl and chucks her right in the lake. And the girl drowns and dies. And Maxwell is just silent and staring. And then 
he slowly turns to me and says, Daddy, he don't like her. <laughs> and oh man, that was just what I, I was so happy because I thought he was going to start crying yeah. or freaking out. But no, he just got to the point. Daddy, he don't like her. I I I love that scene. I think that's one of the best scenes, and uh, I'm so glad that they put the. Because if you remember, for a long time, the actual throwing of the little girl into the lake that was cut out. Yeah. For a really long time, but I loved the whole acting of Boris Karloff in that scene where. He did it, and then you could see on him, he immediately recognized that he did something wrong and got scared. Yeah. You know, not a very monster-like reaction, you know? Yeah. It's really a very childlike reaction, which is one of the things I love about Frankenstein. Uh, hold on a second. Maxwell is next to me, and he says that he has something to tell you. Oh, okay. O- okay, what do you want to tell him, Maxwell? Mommy came back. Mommy came back? Mommy get home. Mommy came home? Yeah, Mommy came home. Um, okay, that's great. Why yeah. don't you go and play now? Or are you going <laughs> to stay with me for this podcast? Yeah. Oh, you're going to stay with me? Yeah. You're going to help me out? Yeah. Okay, cool. So Maxwell is going to be joining us in this podcast, apparently. Oh, Say okay. hi, Maxwell. Hi, Maxwell. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I have a little bit of a history of Universal Studios, um, and I felt that we should talk about it because it, if you're going to talk about the original Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, you got to cover this uh, stuff. Okay, so... Universal Studios was founded way back in April of 1912. It's the oldest film studio in America and the third oldest film studio in the world. Okay. Nice. Have you ever been to their have you personally ever been to that one of their theme sweet. parks or anything that like that? Sweet. I have not. No. Sweet. No. I've been to Universal Studios uh Hollywood like a bajillion times. And then they built Universal Studios Florida and <laughs> And th- then I didn't care. But then they turned it into this big, huge, massive, like, second Disney World now. And there's a there's a Harry Potter section. They, and there's a, a Marvel superheroes section. And it, it just looks absolutely amazing. But I used to go to Universal Studios a lot because I was, it, I was in – I went to a Catholic school for eight years. And then after that, I was uh, in a Catholic youth group. Um, so we would do a lot of trips. And Universal Studios in Disneyland, those were popular destinations for us. Mm-hmm. So I went to Universal Studios a lot. But we're talking way back when we're talking like um, the Miami Vice stunt show spectacular. Okay. I saw that a number of times. And the thing I love about the Miami Vice stunt show spectacular is that it stayed around way longer than it should have. Like way after, like it was like 91, 92, 93, 94, and they still had the Miami Vice stunt show spectacular. So they said, oh, well, we need to replace the Miami Vice stunt show spectacular, but let's replace it with something that's going to last longer, something more important, something that's going to stand the test of time. So you know what they replaced the Miami Vice stunt show spectacular with? The Beetlejuice spectacular? No, Kevin Costner's Waterworld, the Waterworld stunt show spectacular. Oh. And oh man, if if, talk about standing the test of time, right? Everybody knows that dry land is a myth. God, I used to love that movie. I loved that movie. Maxwell, there's there's no video on this, so he, he, like I know you're trying to show him a picture, but he can't see the picture. We're just talking. <laughs> You need to show him something? Okay, try and show it to him. See, this is called book, called Mommy. Okay, 
It, now, uh, Bunny, do you see the picture that Maxwell is showing you? I do not. He doesn't see the picture, okay? He does not see the picture. <laughs> I, you can keep... You, you, you don't have to get closer to the computer. He still won't see it. Okay? Yeah, sorry. That's just how it goes. Um, but Universal Horror as an actual thing started in the early 20s with... Uh, the original Lon Chaney, Lon mm -hmm. Chaney Sr., he did The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is technically not a horror movie, but it, it's right. considered one. And The Phantom of the Opera. Um, it, this is Lon Chaney Sr. Lon Chaney Jr. was also a big guy in the Universal Horror Pantheon because he played um, the Wolfman. And what I love about Lon Chaney Jr. is that a bunch of people played Frankenstein's monster. Yes. And a bunch of people played Dracula, but only one person played the Wolfman in all of the movies that they made. You know, the Wolfman and Frankenstein versus the Wolfman and House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula and um, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. I mean, in all of those movies, they have one person to play the Wolfman. And I always thought, even when I'm like a little kid watching these universal horror movies, okay, well, that's different. You know? Yeah. It's a very different sort of, I really respect Lon Chaney Jr. for being the only... Wolfman, you know? I I loved Lon Chaney Jr. growing up and, and Wolfman. It was so close between Wolfman and Frankenstein for who my favorite was. Wound up being Frankenstein, but I absolutely loved the Wolfman. And then just getting older and finding out more about Lon Chaney Jr.'s life, man, do, do, do I feel just very... I mean, he did well, you know, but yeah. I, I felt just really bad bad for him yeah you know what i mean i mean his father was so huge and so talented and like that was the bar that he had to live up to even so much that they took away his name lon cheney is not his name it's yeah. creighton cheney creighton but creighton. they had him change his name so he could be lon cheney jr you know, and, uh, you know, just to, to have to live up to that and not being able to. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Creighton? Yeah, uh-huh. Creighton. Like, how is that spelled? Uh, let's see. Creighton? Like Peyton, but with a crate? Like he, was, um, like, he was conceived on a crate, and so they named him Creighton. That is possible. You could probably also pronounce it Crichton. Uh, C-R-E-I-G-H-T, I think. Ugh. Who names their kid that? Like, seriously, that's a horrible name. <laughs> That is just hideous. Ugh. Oh, no. I saw I saw the the original black and white Phantom of the Opera. I had the opportunity to see it uh, at the Orpheum Theater in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, nice! Yeah, and it you know a big screen and and just a beautiful theater, and they had a live organist. Mm. do the music and it was really amazing and just wonderful the there were there were hardly anybody there was hardly anybody there too like only about a fifth of the theater was full but it was absolutely amazing and a live organist and then um after the intermission there was a problem with the screen the screen wasn't coming down or coming up or whatever so the organist just Thank played you. And he played for like 20 minutes of whatever he wanted. He just went off. Yeah. It was just the most amazing, beautiful thing. Yes, Maxwell, what do you need to tell my podcast? Mom? Uh, that's it? Nothing? That was a bad guy. That was a bad guy? Bad guy. 
Oh black no! Guy, black guy! Black guy! Oh no! A bad guy! What's uh, the? Hold on. What's the name of the bad guy, Maxwell? Um, he took all my stuff. He took. He took the bad guy. Took all your stuff. My toys. Oh, you know who you should call? Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. You should call Ghostbusters. Thank you, Bella, for helping me out there. Why don't you guys leave now, and I can do my podcast? Okay. This isn't, um... Ghost, please. Oh, Maxwell is pretending to call the Ghostbusters. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. Ghostbusters. Okay, That's Bella, go. Why don't go? You kids go. I'm trying to do this podcast, guys. Next you guys go. Find the Ghostbusters, Maxwell. Go get the Ghostbusters. They will need directions to our house. Okay. Okay? So give them directions. All right. What do I do? Um, you supervise Maxwell in giving directions to the Ghostbusters. Okay, Bella? You are purposefully taking the smallest steps in the world so that you can take your sweet, sweet time exiting yourself <laughs> from my podcast. Go, Bella. One of the things that I like when I think of universal horror movies, I always try to get my kids to watch like the classic universal movies, and I couldn't do them. I couldn't, I couldn't get them to sit and watch them. But then Mattel, the people who made Barbie, right. created a new series of dolls – called Monster High Dolls. Yes, I had gotten one of them for Jeannie for her birthday. Yeah. And so for a while, I was getting Bella to sit down and watch all of the classic Universal Monster movies by saying, hey, uh, you know that doll you have? Okay, well, this doll is the daughter of the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Okay, so let's go and watch the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Okay, this person is the daughter of the Wolfman, so let's go and watch the Wolfman. I remember I sat Maxwell down when he was like one or two to watch Dracula, and he he, he couldn't he couldn't do it. It it was it it just wasn't his thing. He was like a year and a half yeah. maybe. He didn't want to watch yeah. Wolfman, and I tried to get him to watch Frankenstein, but he I guess he was too young. But then I put the Wolfman yeah. on, and for some reason that was just his thing. Yeah, it, it was his thing, and he loved that. And for a while he would ask for it. Dracula. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, and the, he would see Daddy, a uh, 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 wolf movie, and I would put on the Wolf Man, and he would sit and he would watch it. It was on Netflix. I think it might still be on Netflix, but he was obsessed with that for a while. Um. Okay. So, uh, Lon Chaney Senior, Hunchback, Phantom of the Opera. There were some other things that could possibly be classified as horror movies in the 1920s and Universal, but nothing major. Right. Um, like The Cat and the Canary. And another movie that I saw for this, I had never seen it before, but I saw it, The Man Who Laughs. Have you ever seen this? I have not heard, I have not seen The Man Who Laughs. I have heard of it. I do want to track it down and watch it because it is supposedly the inspiration for where the Joker came from. Yes, yes, it's creepy as hell, and and it, the guy who plays the the man who laughs uh, is Conrad Velt, the same guy f who played the monster in the Cabinet of Doctor Caligari. Doctor Caligari is one of my favorites. Yeah, one and of my he, all time favorites. Yeah. The the thing is, the thing is, is that the movie The Man Who Laughs is available on YouTube, and it's absolutely free. There's just a catch. The music to accompany the film is the score for the first Batman movie. Oh, no. So it's kind of weird, because it's the whole movie... It's just that the soundtrack is the score for the Batman film. And I had a hard time sitting down and watching it because I'm like, well, it's a silent movie, so does the music matter that much? And I sat down and I tried to watch it and I'm like, yes, I can't do this. I can't <laughs> I can't sit here and listen to like Danny Elfman's weirdo music while trying to watch this universal horror movie. I need the universal horror movie music. So I went and tracked down the movie. And it really is beautiful. If you think you can watch a movie without the right score, go ahead and search The Man Who Laughs on YouTube, because it's there. I mean, it's there. I, I might give it a try. I might give it a try. Just because now, it, now it is, it's definitely on my must-watch must list. It really is creepy. Just, just that guy's smile in his face. It really is just a... 
a freaky ass movie. Phantom of the Opera itself, though, I had a lot of problems with, except for whenever Lon Chaney was on screen. Oh yeah, when Lon That's... Chaney was on screen, that movie is brilliant. Yeah. Any of the other parts are really you can stop yourself by being strangled by putting your hands up to your ears. <laughs> yeah. And they walk around like that, and nobody thought, this is stupid? Yeah. I often wonder that in the in the, the musical, too, the Phantom of the Opera, the Andrew Lloyd Webber, yeah. they keep singing to keep your hand at the level of your eyes. And it's like, really? <laughs> That's kind of stupid. Yeah. So so Universal, they make some horror movies, but not a lot of horror movies. And then the 30s come around, and then the Great Depression happens. And then in spite of the Great Depression, or maybe because of the Great Depression, in 1931, they did both Dracula and Frankenstein. Yes, yes. Uh, two very different movies, um, but definitely set them on the horror movie path and the horror monster path uh now lon cheney was originally supposed to play dracula before getting bella lugosi and bella lugosi was supposed to play the monster but turned uh, down the part um uh that may or may not be a myth i was i was i i, I read a full book on because you were sick for so long yeah so I like overly prepared for this podcast okay. and i read this big huge book on universal horror movies and now um they have uncovered some some like uh studio memos and stuff like that which may say that lugosi was going to get the part but when Lugosi originally was offered the part, the part of the monster was completely different. The part of the monster was literally just a mindless killer who showed no emotion and just killed everyone. And it looks like Lugosi was dropped. Mm. But the part that he was going to take was completely different from the part that they eventually gave. Yeah. I Did had heard... See? That Lugosi wanted to play the Doctor, which I yeah. think would have been fucking awesome. Yeah, that would have been pretty awesome. That would have been pretty awesome. You know what uh, upsets me about Frankenstein? I was thinking about this. There was no Mexican version of Frankenstein. And I am wondering why they didn't do that. Because when they did Dracula, they said, hey, we've got all of this sets and stuff. Why don't we just uh, do a Spanish language version of this same movie and have the the Mexicans record it at night mm -hmm. while we're all at home? So they made a Spanish language version of Dracula that came out at the same time as the English version of Dracula. Nora. And the interesting thing is that the Spanish language version of Dracula is infinitely better than the American version because the Spanish people could actually see, okay, what did they do today? On, okay, now let's make let's make ours better. <laughs> so so they have so they do better on, camera on. angles and better better lighting and better this and that. And I'm just, I'm interested at the fact that they didn't do that with Frankenstein. They could have. I'm sure they could have. Maybe they hadn't thought of it yet. As far as I know, it's only Dracula that, that they, they actually did that with, though. Yeah, but they could have done it with Frankenstein. There could have been a Mexican Frankenstein. That would have been awesome, a Mexican please Frankenstein. Please yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to picture that. That's awesome. <laughs> I want to be in a Mexican Frankenstein. My well, I'm not a good Mexican, but... My name is... What? Cowboy. Oh, uh, Maxwell, uh, Maxwell just wants everybody to know that his name is Cowboy now. My name Cowboy? Okay. Yeah. But 1931 truly started the Universal yeah. Horror franchise, which continued through the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Uh, the Mummy, the yeah. Wolfman, um, the, the Invisible Man is really good. Yeah. A lot of people die in that movie. <laughs> the Creature from the Black Lagoon was really good, and then they made a whole bunch of sequels that were horrible, but the first one is just great. Yes. Love that movie. Yes. I have a hard time. I have a hard time with Frankenstein because of my own guilt. Because 
you know, I, I have my own religion based on Ed Wood. Um, and Bella Lugosi is a saint in my religion. But right. in all honesty, I like the Frankenstein movies more. <laughs> than the Dracula movies? Yes. Dracula is a good movie, but I like Lugosi more as a person because he had a fascinating life and a tragic life. But I like the Frankenstein movies more. Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. Those are freaking classics. And I'll watch those ten times and maybe watch Dracula once or twice. Dracula drags a lot. Yes, it does. And that is pretty much the problem there. And I think that may be because they were trying to be too faithful to the stage play as opposed to trying to make a good movie. Um, some of the some of the lighting and the shadows that Todd Browning had used in Dracula, though I find absolutely stunning. And, of course, Dwight Fry as Renfield is amazing. Oh, yeah. That laugh of his that he had, that... <laughs> yeah, that was, that was just... That was brilliant. Yeah. You know... But if I'm going to pick a Dracula movie or a Dracula type movie, yeah, then I, I got to go with Nos- Nosferatu. Yeah, you know, as a, as just a much better movie, a much creepier movie. Yeah, and I also kind of think that for me, um, growing up as a child, I did not really like evil creatures. Really. You know, um, so like Dracula was just out and out an evil creature. Yeah. And I, I could not get into him because of that. Whereas Frankenstein, Frankenstein is a is a childlike character who winds up being a victim of circumstance. And the Wolfman is very similar where he has no power over what he is doing. So like... Both of those characters you can kind of give a little bit of forgiveness to. Yeah. You know, where you really can't do the same with Dracula. Right. I just always feel guilty when I'm sitting and watching a Frankenstein movie and really loving it because I feel that religiously I should be this excited about Dracula Mm -hmm. because of Bela Lugosi. But Frankenstein and Bride and Frankenstein, they're just so much more fun. Yeah. Oh, right from the opening. Frankenstein just has the best opening ever. It reminds me, the opening warning reminds me of a lot of B-movies from the 40s and 50s and 60s. You know, those sort of warnings that they give in the beginning. Like the Screaming Skull. Right. Like in the beginning of the Screaming Skull where they warn you that this film is so scary it might scare you to death. <laughs> And the insurance policies and all that kind yeah. of stuff, and the ambulances yeah. waiting outside of the theaters. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but to my knowledge, this is the first time anything like that had ever been done. Yeah. Speaking of, oh, I'm, I am just going to bring it all the way around. When I I saw Jurassic Park the day it came out, and in the theater, just to be safe, they had um, employees come in before every showing that opening weekend and it warn everyone in the theater that the film was uh, uh, at times graphic and scary and might be too scary for young children. Okay. And for those with a weak constitution, like they, like the, the people who owned the theater were, were warning people that it was too scary. Oh, man. And I thought that that was interesting. And in, in reality, yeah, that is a bit of a violent film. Yeah. Especially for a film that, you know, that had kids' toys and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I always hate that. When they, when they make kids' toys for something that kids can't watch. They did that for um, Starship Troopers, for Christ's sake. <laughs> It's Starship Troopers toys. They had a they had a line of Breaking Bad toys. Yeah, but by the time that came out, they had that whole you know collector's sort of thing. 
Starship Troopers and Jurassic Park were kind of before that became mainstream. Yeah. You know? But these were toys that were advertised in, you know, Saturday morning oh cartoons and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Always upsets me. Now, I have a couple of questions here about Frankenstein. Although, Frankenstein, if asked, I, I, I am very likely to say is my favorite movie. Comes close between Frankenstein and a couple of others. You okay. know, but with that being said, why do you send the illiterate hunchback to go get the brain? Um, because you don't want to get your ass caught dirty. You know, and on top of it, the brains were on display so that the students would be able to tell the difference between a normal brain and an abnormal brain. Yes. Dr. Henry Frankenstein being a genius, so much so that he's going to create life, when Fritz, Fritz, not Igor, Fritz, Fritz, Fritz. when he yeah. comes back with the brain, wouldn't he have just been able to look at it and be like, that's an abnormal brain? That's a good point. He really is very hands on with this. You know, if he's doing brain surgery, he should know what the difference is in this brain. Mm hmm. Especially since that's what they're teaching the medical students. Yeah. You know. He should be past that point. He should be able to look and be, hmm, abnormal brain. Maybe, yeah. I sh- maybe I shouldn't use this one. Yeah. I, 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 I honestly never thought about that. But that is true. And also, who wears a sport coat and an ascot when grave robbing? I do all the time, frankly. Yeah, it's, it is my normal grave robbing uniform. I feel like I feel like if you're going to be digging up a dead body, you know, maybe some jeans or like overalls, not not like your best ascot and sports coat. And that kind of sort of leads me into the gay aspect. I don't think that this that the original Frankenstein can be seen as having any sort of gay aspect. I mean, besides the whole, no, I won't marry you, Elizabeth. I know you're a beautiful woman who wants to marry me, but I instead I want to hang out in my secret lab with my hunchmate, with my hunchback. hunchback life mate and fiddle around with body parts. But mm-hmm. I feel that Bride of Frankenstein, yes, has gay written all over it. But have you seen the movie Gods and Monsters? Uh, yes, I have. Not in quite a while, but yeah. And yeah. And I, I did find that interesting for where James Whale was coming from for what the actual content of the movie winds up being. Yeah. Because it, James Whale, he did Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, and he was openly gay during a period in time when that wasn't done and they turned that into a play and they turned that play into a movie which is now the only time that it is acceptable to call Brendan Fraser a good actor <laughs> it is never acceptable to call friend Brendan Fraser a good actor unless you are watching the movie Gods and Monsters although it kind of reminds me of Batista because what is Brendan Fraser in Gods and Monsters? He's a clueless, dumb, young actor. Right. Mm-hmm. So that just might not be a stretch for him. <laughs> like Batista in Guardians of the Galaxy. When he plays the, the completely clueless. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I still think it's a crime that um, the Academy overlooked him for his magnificent work in George of the Jungle. Yes. And Dudley Do Right. Let's not forget and that. Dudley Do Right. Yes. Dudley Do Right. Wow. And what was the name of that movie when he was in a bunker for like thirty years? Yeah, I I always want to say Biodome, but that's not it. No, no. That movie was set in Tucson, Arizona. Biodome. 
So that makes it a horrible movie. <laughs> because Tucson is a horrible place where dreams go to die. Where dreams go to die. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know the movie you're talking about, but uh, I don't Blast know. Blast from the Past. Blast from the Past. Blast from the Past. That was the name of that movie. I just showed Isabella the the first... Um, I, I was at the doctor, and they, they had just the TV on, but it was on silent. They right. just apparently had the TV on just to make people feel better. And I think it was TNT, but some station had uh, Brendan Fraser's The Mummy on. And I hadn't seen that forever, and I'm like, oh, you know what? This movie was all right. I bet if I get that movie and show it to Isabella that she would like it. And, yeah, she really, really liked it. She thought it was good. Well, Brendan Fraser himself, I, I, oh, somebody's at the door. Hold on. Okay. One second. <gasps> Century Link. Hi, CenturyLink! Uh, Jeff Green, and I am in the middle of a show, so I got out. Uh, Yay! So, well, you missed it. The CenturyLink lady was here. Kate Lady was here? Yeah, the CenturyLink lady. You mi totally missed the CenturyLink lady, Maxwell. Yeah. So it's not running anymore. Bella, you keep trying to get it. We're not recording video. You know that, right? Okay, we're just recording audio. Okay. You totally missed it. The CenturyLink lady showed up. Yeah. I, I just missed that. Yeah, Maxwell, you missed the CenturyLink lady. Say CenturyLink. CenturyLink. Say it closer to the computer. Say CenturyLink. CenturyLink. Okay, that's too close to the computer. That's like way too close. CenturyLink. To Stop it, Bella. <laughs> is not a kid's story time. The kids are taking over my podcast. <laughs> Can't believe you kids. <laughs> Bella. Bella. Come. Come here. Come here. You've seen the original Frankenstein, right? Yeah, it was a long time ago, though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maxwell, say Century Link. Century Link. Yay, Century Link. I have a movie running. Huh? I have a movie on. What movie do you have on? It's a Monster High movie. You're watching a Monster High movie. See, that's interesting because we're talking about universe. Yeah, go ahead and run away. You punk. <laughs> no, go ahead and run. Go, go watch your Monster High movie. Oh, you're a punk and you're grounded until you're 40. You're a furball. Yeah, furball. Who are you calling a furball, you furball? Furball. furball. <laughs> are you back? That was Comcast trying to sell me Comcast and get me I away from my current provider, which is Comcast. I thought it was CenturyLink. Is that what the lady said? <laughs> Did she say CenturyLink? Aren't they the yeah, same? I don't know. I'm back. Bella, <laughs> go, stop. Stop. Go, Bella. <laughs> I find it. I told you. Okay. It, there's a there's a bad word that we use here around the house called a, we we call each other furball. Okay. <laughs> it comes from a specific episode of the PBS cartoon The Berenstain Bears. Where really? Sis, okay. Yeah, Sister Bear stays up late and watches a 90210 rip-off show but for bears. Okay. And the show is for older kids, and they start using the word furball. And these two high school bears are playing basketball, and they say, Pass the ball, you furball. Who are you calling a furball, furball? And so Sister Bear goes around calling everybody furball, and she gets in trouble. <laughs> and that's when Sister Bear learns that furball is a bad word, and there are some words that are bad, and you shouldn't say them. Since then, we've been calling each other furball. 
Furball. Shut up, you furball. You shut up, you furball. You're a furball. You're a furball. You're a furball. You're a furball. <laughs> you, you smell like furball. You are a furball. Your face is a furball. You eat like a furball. I do eat like a furball, and I'm proud of it. You have a problem? You, you can't use that word. That's our word. You eat. Like a furball, you are a furball. Furball, you're a, you're a furball. You're a punk. I do not eat furballs, Maxwell. <laughs> you furball? I'm not furball. I'm not well. Ooh, okay. You got serious <laughs> there. Don't put. A, don't do a sad face. Don't do a sad face. Okay. So Frankenstein, 1931, loosely based on 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 the book with liberal use of finger quotes. <laughs> Based very, on a- very loosely based. Yeah. And since you bring that up, have you have you read the book? Uh, I tried reading it when I was in high school just to like make myself seem smart. I think I read it. It kind of it kind of sucks. It, but same thing with with uh, Dracula with the book Dracula. Yeah. Because a lot of it, especially in the beginning, is just uh Day 14 on the train. I ate a pomegranate. And it's just, okay, we, we don't need to know every detail of every second leading up to the exciting stuff that we know will eventually show up, you know? Yeah, I, I much prefer the movie, in particular this movie version, to the book. Yes, absolutely. So they did Frankenstein in 1931... And then they immediately went to James Whale and talked to him about a sequel. Uh, And he said no, but they eventually did a sequel in 1935, and that's Bride of Frankenstein. And Bride of Frankenstein is so wonderful, such an absolutely wonderful movie, that I feel that if you're going to talk about the original Frankenstein, you also have to talk about Bride of Frankenstein, because they're both wonderful movies but in 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 a different way because these are even though this is a sequel to the original frankenstein these really are two completely different feeling films you know yes yeah there's definitely a different vibe going on it again an excellent beginning to the movie very different very different than the beginning of the first film definitely Mm mm-hmm it, yeah. it, it took a while for me to realize, like watching these movies as a kid over and over again, it took a really long time for me to realize that the woman in the beginning is also the woman who plays the bride of Frankenstein at the end of the movie. Yeah. I think I was like 11 or 12 when I realized that, and it's like I, like I found my first Easter egg, like in a movie, you know? Yeah. We, we were... Like quasi religious, we were not really a religious family, but uh, had some of the religious trappings and things like that. Like there are certain things that you shouldn't say and stuff like that. So I found the beginning of Bride of Frankenstein as a child to be incredibly shocking. Like really? I, I could not believe that Lord Byron would would dare say some of the things that he would say. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Just That's be like, awesome. how, how can you say that? God, God might really kill you now. <laughs> that, that's kind of cute. <laughs> I like that. That's, a, that's, that's kind of sort of adorable. <laughs> Just FYI. Yeah. And then... uh. Having grown up, have you ever seen the movie, the movie Gothic? Yes, yes, yes. I I have seen it before because my brother was married for like a heartbeat, mm-hmm. and his his fiance wife was obsessed with that movie. That movie, and then. The sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Shock, Shock Treatment. Treatment. Yeah. She was obsessed with those two movies. And Velvet Goldmine. She was obsessed with those three movies. And she would just watch them over and over again. So, yeah, I've seen Gothic. Gothic, not a great movie, but I, I do appreciate it for for it being pretty much an expansion 
on yep. that opening for The Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see that. Other the than reason- that, it gets really boring and really draggy and <laughs> yeah. not really worth the time of watching except for a curiosity if you are into the Universal movies. Yeah. <laughs> Sh- yeah. Lord, Lord Byron. Lord Biden, who who Lord Byron. who is a fun dude. If you read up any history on Lord Byron, he was a really. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a my my favorite Lord Byron story was when he was going to school. Uh, he had gotten a dog, and it turned out that having a dog was against the school charter, so they made him get rid of the dog. So he got a bear. Oh, he got a bear? <laughs> he got a bear instead. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. And there was nothing in the rules about that. <laughs> That's that that sounds like like a really strange Hogwarts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is what that sounds like. Yeah. Reading reading about Universal Studios and the Universal Horror Movies. So, uh, I learned the reason why this film is so wonderful, Bride of Frankenstein, because James Whale absolutely refused to do a sequel. He, he, he said, no, because Frankenstein is such a great movie, there is no way that a sequel could be as good as the first movie. There's no way that that's going to happen. So eventually he agreed to do the movie because he had an epiphany. He said, well, if we can't top the original then let's just do a second one, but have a bunch of fun with it. He yes. specifically said, since we can top the first one, let's just have a hoot. <laughs> and Bride of Frankenstein is definitely a hoot because it's a much more, it's a, it's a, it's a more fun film. It's yes, a wackier it film. Mm-hmm. It's a strange one. There's a lot of differences. First off, first off, there is a different Elizabeth. Yes, there is. And that was so many other times, but this is the first time in my life, like watching this, like at like eight or nine years old, saying, wait a second, that's a different person playing that character than in the other movie. Mm-hmm. They got a different person. I wonder why that happened. And I figured out why that happened. In Frankenstein, the part of Elizabeth was played by Mae Clark. Right. And apparently, she was in a nasty ass fucking car wreck that scarred her face for life. Ah, which is why they replaced her with a younger, more beautiful woman in the second film because she was a uh, totally effed up in a goddamn car crash. And is I, that when she started wrestling with the fabulous Mula? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I always wondered why there was a different Elizabeth. Yeah. And she she I don't know what her deal is, but right before uh Dr. Pretorius shows up for the first time, she decides to go for the Oscar for overacting. <laughs> and she has that bizarre speech where she's talking about I dreamed I saw a specter entering the room, coming for your life. There he is, right there. Don't take it. <laughs> nuts for no reason whatsoever like this is my big scene yeah. I better really go for it and she, for no reason whatsoever it's so stupid Um, and who was that absolutely fabulous woman in the beginning at the windmill and she's uh, been in a couple of other things too oh uh, my yeah. god Una O'Connor. She was also in The Invisible Man, yes. playing essentially the same type of character. I love this woman because when I was thinking about the differences between Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, number one, uh, Bride of Frankenstein is more fun. Number two, there are different Elizabeths. And number three, better comic relief. Oh, my God. She was genius. Because in Frankenstein, there's comic relief, and it's essentially like like the dad, like the rich guy, the burgomaster, and I'm not even I'm still not sure what that is. I like to think that he's just the master of hamburgers. 
<laughs> well, he was actually the Baron, and then the Burgermeister was under him. Okay, so the Burgermeister is like the cop of the town. And That's kind of how I took it, almost like the sheriff. Yeah, well, then the Baron, he was the comic relief, because he was like the old guy who didn't care anymore. Oh, he was great. I absolutely loved him. I, I, I loved how how everything revolved around him the the way the way a rich person would think yeah <laughs> you know but uh Minnie in Bride of Frankenstein totally beats Baron Frankenstein cuz she's just absolutely charming yes and and her little hop skips that she does and and her voice that and that high pitched bizarre voice yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, she is absolutely wonderful. And so when I finally like got around to seeing the Invisible Man, I was just struck by the, oh my god, that's Minnie from Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> Holy crap, she's in this too. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Like I fell in love. I like I think I would have liked in, the Invisible Man a lot less if she hadn't have been in it. Like right there in the beginning, and I'm like, holy crap, that. Yeah. As far as I know, she was in a lot of other things, too, but these were just her two horror roles, you know, so those are things that we know her from. But from what I understand, she did a lot of other work at the time as well. As far as as far as I've learned on IMDb, yes, I haven't really seen any because I kind of focus on these. So what is the deal with Dr. Pretorius? Not too effeminate, is he? No, he's pretty damn effeminate. <laughs> yeah. Um, he kind of gets tossed in out of nowhere, and he's not really given much of a explanation or anything like that. There is some sort of a past between he and Henry that seems to be from his school days. Yeah. But they like don't delve a- into it too terribly far. No, they do not. But there does seem to be a, a, a bit of... Uh, this film could definitely have homosexual interpretations. I got that line specifically from Wikipedia. It says right here in big bold letters, homosexual interpretations. <laughs> well, it is the story of two men procreating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good point. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. I I mean, I I he does seem very gay, Doctor Pretorius. And I was I I I looked this up because I thought it was really weird that Doctor Pretorius is like, hey, I've created life too. Look at these bizarre, weird ass little people I have in these jars. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell sort of strange ass aside have we just taken mm-hmm. where suddenly we're looking at tiny people in jars? Apparently that's a thing and they're called homunculus. homunculus. I thought homunculus I thought homunculus was just a really awesome name for a metal band. <laughs> but apparently homunculus is Latin for little men. Really? And that way back in the day people thought that this was possible to create these tiny little men homunculus. And that's what Dr. Pretorius does with those bizarre little jars that he has created life. He has created homunculus. Mm-hmm. They, they really needed more room. You know, they seemed a little restrictive in the, uh, yes, they look the like little very jars. small jars. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sea monkeys generally get more living space. Yeah. Uh, popular, popularized in 16th century alchemy and 19th century fiction, homunculus is historically referred to as the creation of a miniature yet fully formed human. So that's what he has in his weird little jars there. That right there, when he shows his, when he takes out his jars and starts showing the homunculus to, uh, to Dr. Frankenstein. That's really the part 
where suddenly this movie is taking a left turn into wacky town. <laughs> yes. But it still has a lot of sweetness to it as well. Oh, yeah. Even Absolutely. with the wacky town. Now, why did he try so hard to keep the king and the queen apart? Because I would think that there would be good money in little people fucking. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see that. I can absolutely see that. I, I would be traveling town to town with that show. Yes. I would pay good money to see that as well. <laughs> but a, and, and then this movie is also the movie where the monster starts to talk. Which I absolutely loved, and I'm sorry that they, they turned away from that in later movies. Yeah, like uh, Son of Frankenstein, which I have just recently started to really like and care about. Like when I first saw Son of Frankenstein, I'm like, okay, this is like a lot longer and very serious and it's not really doing anything for me. But it took a while for me to warm up to Basil Rathbone and, mm -hmm. and, and that sort of strange interpretation of a Frankenstein yeah. movie. Yeah. 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 But once I saw Son of Frankenstein, yeah. then uh, large portions of Young Frankenstein were funnier to me. Yes, it was. Yes, it was, because now you know why the guy had the wooden arm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now I knew why the guy had the freaking wooden arm in freaking Bride of Frankenstein. I'm like, holy shit, mm -hmm. <laughs> he does have a wooden arm. Now, do you consider Young Frankenstein to be a part of the overall... Universal Frankenstein mythos? Uh, yes, I absolutely do. So do I. It's, it, they did such a good job with that movie that it's hard to separate it from I also, the rest. I also, I also feel that um, another film that you have to uh, put into the Universal Frankenstein mythology is... Um, uh, what used to be my favorite Frankenstein movie, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Oh, yes. Because mm -hmm. I loved that movie. I was obsessed with that movie when I was a kid. I just thought it was so great. Look at this, and it's all the horror characters and Abbott and Costello. I thought that that was amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Plus, you get Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman in the same film. You know what I came up with? I came up with a very interesting theory about universal horror movies. Okay, go for it. And I, I, I don't think I've ever heard this said anywhere else, but I think that this is my own theory, and I think it's right on the money. Universal horror movies were the first Marvel comic book movies. Because Marvel movies, they said, okay, let's do Iron Man, and now let's do Hulk, but let's have Iron Man make an appearance in this, and okay, let's do Iron Man 2 and do Iron Man 3. Okay, now let's do Thor, and let's do Captain America, and now let's have all of them together. Now let's do their own separate movies. Now let's do Captain America with Iron Man. Now let's put all of them together again. And really, that's what they did with the Universal Horror Movies. Yeah, it's the first time that we had crossovers and things like that yeah. in any movie that I know of. Yeah. Uh, and they are talking about trying to do it again, but I have not heard anything good about it. Well, the problem was was that they said they were going to do that and then immediately release that horrible Dracula movie that just came out. Right. And it's like, no, no, that's not the movie to release if you guys are going to do this. But really, they, yeah, Universal recently announced that they were going to uh, create a shared universe by rebooting all of their classic monsters and have them all share the same world. And I just, it, it struck me while watching Bride of Frankenstein that Universal already did that. Mm -hmm. In fact, they did that first. Mm-hmm. I mean, I uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. That was amazing, you know. And then uh, House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula. Those movies were all horrible, but still, those shared universes. But they, they have their charm. <laughs> they do have their charm. Yeah, they're horrible yeah, they movies, but they, you know, you can't help but watch it and smile. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And Wolfman. It, 
Frankenstein meets Wolfman, uh, it, it's a friggin' miracle that it came out as good as it did. Yeah. With as badly they were botching it up. Yeah. You know, but still a very enjoyable movie, still a fun movie. You know, um, but good God, you know, tell Bella Lugosi what part it is he's really supposed to be playing and don't keep changing it on him all the time. <laughs> yeah. Now, from what I also understand, he was supposed to speak in that movie in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, and he was supposed to be speaking in Igor's voice because that's where we left it off in Ghost of Frankenstein, where they put Igor's brain into the monster. Yeah, as as far as I know, he actually did record dialogue, but they decided at the last second to not use that dialogue, and Bela Lugosi didn't realize that until he actually saw the movie. And at some points, you can see his lips moving in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. That he is speaking, but there's no sound to it. So it's... You know, that movie, it's almost like they, they were actively trying to kill that movie, but it still turned out to be a pretty good movie. Yeah, it's a damn good movie. It's a damn, damn good film. <laughs> now, of course, we, we cannot forget the old blind man in the cabin. Oh, yes, the old blind man in the cabin. God, again, done wonderfully in uh, freaking... Young Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a wonderful scene. But it is kind of touching. It is kind of like a tear-jerking moment in Bride of Frankenstein. Yes, it is, because, because Frankenstein gets a friend, the old guy gets a friend, you know, and y you, could, you could see how this is playing out. He's teaching Frankenstein about different things, and... You know, it's very nice and comfortable as long as it's just between the two of them until until the world invades again. Yeah, that's a good that's a that's that's a good that's a good line. Mm -hmm. Good ass line. And, and again, we could also take a look at that for its homoerotic nature. Absolutely. Because Frankenstein had to be paying for that soup somehow. <laughs> yep, no one rides for free. That's right. <laughs> but then you get to the end, and they're building the bride. And the bride shows up, and the bride rejects Frankenstein, the, the monster. Right. And so the monster is upset, and he kind of stumbles off all monster emo. And he rests his arm on a lever. Mm -hmm. And apparently, this castle has been built with a lever that if you pull it down, the entire castle explodes. Which is a bit of a design flaw, I would think. Apparently, the people who made the Death Star Yes. <laughs> also made this castle because that is a ridiculous thing to have inside of your castle. Isn't it just begging for you to like hang your coat up on it? Yeah. You yeah. Know? It, it's like, and there are, there are a bunch of other levers too. It's not like this is the only lever. There are a bunch of levers. It just so happens that that one will blow everyone to atoms. Yes. To atoms, mm -hmm. not atoms, to atoms. Atoms. To atoms. <laughs> and it's also not a lever. It is a lever. A lever. <laughs> Look out, the lever. <laughs> and then, it, so that's, that's Dr. Frankenstein saying that in a very ridiculous way. But then that's immediately followed up by Dr. Pretorius saying, don't touch that lever. You'll blow us all to atoms. <laughs> and that's amazing. Oh, and another Easter egg that I found as a child that I was in love with was the fact that 
the monster lets Dr. Frankenstein and Elizabeth go. Yeah, you I go, found that strange. You live, but Dr. Pretorius and I, we we deserve to be dead. So he pulls the lever, and the castle explodes, and you see Dr. Frankenstein and, and Elizabeth escaping, and yet there are scenes when the castle is being blown to atoms where you can still see Dr. Frankenstein inside of the lab. Mm-hmm. Because apparently in the original script, both of the doctors were supposed to die. But they decided at the last second to let Dr. Frankenstein and Elizabeth live. Which doesn't really make much sense because you would think it would be the other way around. Because Dr. Pictorius never really did anything cruel to Frankenstein, to the monster. Yeah, yeah, he that's was, a good point. He was a bit stern with him at times, you know. Yeah, he definitely took the he took the uh, the butch role in that definitely. relationship. Yeah, um, but did not like really abuse him or anything like that. Whereas anything, there was a if, long if, line of hatred between him and Doctor Frankenstein. Yeah, I mean, if anything. Dr. Pretorius was really awesome to the monster. I especially love the scene where they meet inside of the cemetery or the catacombs or wherever yes. they're at when suddenly the monster shows up and Dr. Pretorius isn't scared or freaked out. He's just like, well, hello, would you like some <laughs> wine? It's my only weakness. Mm -hmm. And he's like, here, have a drink, have a smoke. Why don't you just sit down with me, girlfriend? <laughs> it's like, oh my god it's the frankenstein's monster i've been looking for you everywhere sit down let's talk how you doing mm -hmm. it's like <laughs> other people are just like oh my god it's the monster but he's like oh my god you want some wine <laughs> and they're just sitting down and having a good time having a damn fine time so I don't see where that turn comes in where suddenly the Frankenstein monster where the yeah. Frankenstein monster suddenly decides that Pretorius should be dead. Yeah. Yeah. Not exactly sure where that comes from. Yeah. But we can all agree I think that we should all look out the Leva. The Leva. Look out! The lever! <laughs> My family knows that. I say that so much over the past, like, five years. That if I say, look out! There's a good chance, like shaving a haircut, that right. someone else in the house will finish up with the lever! <laughs> so now, which is your favorite universal monster and monster movie um my favorite monster movie is probably bride of frankenstein because it is a very wacky one it's it's a lot it doesn't take itself as seriously as frankenstein there are less scenes that drag in bride of frankenstein mm -hmm. it's a whole bunch of fun but i gotta say though my favorite monster is definitely the creature from the black lagoon I'm not exactly sure. what the, the movie is a good movie. It's not my favorite movie, but just something about that suit and that monster crawling out of the murky depths. The monster just looks so awesome. Oh, he totally did. And yeah. those underwater scenes are just so amazing. I just absolutely love the creature from the Black Lagoon. And then, when I was in high school and college, and to this day, I've just been really obsessed with pinball. I love pinball games. Really love a good pinball game. And they created a Creature from the Black Lagoon pinball game. And the amazing thing about it is it's really not about the movie Creature from the Black Lagoon. It's really a pinball game about going to the drive-in. Okay. 
the whole pinball game is basically it's the 1950s and you're at the drive-in and the whole mission of the pinball game is to try and get the movie started. Uh huh. Okay. And then when you get the movie started, you have to find the girl and rescue her from the creature. But it really is just set in the fifties and nineteen fifties. Music is playing like "Rock Around the Clock" while you try and get the movie started by spelling the word "film." And so for F, you have to go down the slide, and then you have to open the snack bar, and then you have to <laughs> kiss the girl that you went to the drive-in with, and a whole bunch of things have to happen before you before you start the movie Creature from the Black Lagoon, but it's my absolute favorite pinball game of all time because it's just so much fun. I found a place in Oklahoma City that that is it, it's, uh, it's some sort of family fun center. Anyway, they have the largest collection of pinball games in the Midwest. Yeah. They have the Creature from the Black Lagoon and it's just, I played it recently and it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. <laughs> But there's just something about that, the look of that monster, the creature from the Black Lagoon, that I just absolutely love. What is your favorite movie and or monster? Well, it is the original Frankenstein, and it is Frankenstein. The Wolfman comes so close, though. There's just he something, really does. But there's just something that's very human about the Wolfman. I really like Frankenstein's childlike qualities, which yeah. which we see in both of the movies. Um, and the original makeup in the first movie was so good. The heavy eyelids, which they didn't do quite as well in Bride of Frankenstein, although he still looked really good in Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. But that the, the first looks of the monster were just really kind of breathtaking and the the action of him sitting in the chair and reaching for the sunlight and all of those kinds of things um you know it always kind of feels like like he probably would have been a decent guy if he was given a chance you know yeah. and he really wouldn't have been a monster and i think that that is kind of what appeal to my my child's heart you know what i mean yeah that you could hang out with this monster possibly just don't make fun of him and don't try to you know burn him to death and things like that yeah in that first frankenstein movie it really does feel like dr frankenstein just immediately rejects the monster that's pretty much how it went in the book too yeah, like right from the beginning, he's just like, oh, I can't stand it. I can't be around this monster. What have I done? This is horrible. And it's like, dude, you're giving him a complex. Yeah, yeah. It, like, was, oh. it was immediately, I, I've sinned against God, and now I've got to get rid of this creature, this horrible yeah, abomination. No, no wonder the monster went nuts. I mean, you automatically shunned it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, you damn, know. you're a bad dad. <laughs> what, if, what if you just gave it a chance? Yeah. yeah. Um, let's Frankenstein see. Frankenstein just needs a hug. <laughs> what about other Frankenstein movies? Like the, there was a whole series of Hammer films. Uh, yeah. Then there's the one with Robert De Niro. Uh, is that the, that's the Kenneth Branagh one? Yeah. I I remember liking that one when it came out, but I I tried to watch that a couple of months ago, and I just I couldn't I couldn't sit and watch it. It's really too close to the book for, for my tastes. Yeah, that's a very Kenneth Branagh sort of a... Do you know what Kenneth Branagh's doing next? Do you know what movie he's doing next? No. He is directing the live-action Cinderella movie for Disney. Really? Okay. Yeah. Like, I, I, went to the, I went to the movies with my friend Allison, and we were looking at the posters... And she said, that Cinderella movie, I forgot who did it, but, but it's done by someone surprising. And I'm like, really? I can't believe I'm surprised. Kenneth Branagh's doing the goddamn Cinderella movie? <laughs> what the hell is Kenneth Branagh doing the Cinderella movie? <laughs> I was surprised by that. Well, he had done Thor, didn't he? Yeah, he did the first yeah. Thor movie. 
Yeah. And that that's what gave it its uh, gravitas. Mm-hmm. Hey. Yeah. Uh, have you seen Flesh for Frankenstein? Uh, no, I don't think I have. Oh, that is that is the one that also goes by uh, Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. I- is that something that I should watch? Most definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. Uh, but I... not in a comparison sort of a way. You know, you can't compare these movies at all. The Flesh for Frankenstein is a ridiculously fun movie. Ooh, okay. It's, I like those type of movies. It's very stupid. Yeah. And, well, it, and stars a very young Udo Kier. <laughs> Udo Kier. Who, who has been in millions of things now. Yeah, he has. Yeah. Udo Kier. What other Frankenstein movies has there been? I can't think of too many other Frankenstein. There- movies like dracula there have been a bajillion draculas but i can't think of too many frankensteins there was also one which other was than all the two-part made for television movie called frankenstein the true story starring michael sarazen which i liked quite a lot i think i remember that like it was that a tnt movie or something like that Oh, much earlier. This was the 70s at oh, yeah? some point. Yeah. Okay. This was like the early 70s. And it started off... It was a lot... They built the relationship between the monster and Dr. Frankenstein a lot better in that one, where there was a period where uh, he was trying to teach the creature. But at the same time, the creature came out pretty much perfect where he did not look monstrous he was a good looking guy things like this you know and then uh dr frankenstein kind of turned against him as the creature started to become ugly yeah okay so that was kind Uh, of an interesting take oh there was also uh the bride with sting Oh yeah, the Sting one. I remember the Sting one. We had rewatched that one a couple of months ago, and it is still a very good movie. Oh, you know what? You know, you know what? Uh, Frankenstein movie I like. Um, Lady Frankenstein. Lady Frankenstein. Yeah. Yes, I haven't the, seen that uh, one Joseph in a while. Joseph Cotton, in, uh-huh. like a, an Italian movie. Mm-hmm. With the egghead Frankenstein, kind of basically. Yeah, and uh, um, Mariska Hargitay's dad, Mickey Hargitay, is in that one. He's he's like the monster or whatever. <laughs> he was also in uh, uh, Bloody Pit. Yes, Bloody yeah. Pit of Horror. Yeah, yeah. His head was misshapen and very egg-like. Yeah, like he was a walking thumb. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what Frankenstein movie I love to hate? Which one? Frankenstein meets the space monster. I... It has nothing to do with Frankenstein. Yeah, they should have taken Frankenstein's name off of it. You know? Uh, yeah. Other than that, I I find that some campy fun. Yeah. Just not a Frankenstein movie at all. Yeah. In no way a Frankenstein movie. Yeah. So but like if I if I paid for tickets to go see this like opening night, I would have been really pissed off. <laughs> yeah, but it was a double feature, so <laughs> it, it, you probably would have yeah. said, Oh yeah, this is horrible, but let's see what that second movie is. Do you do you know what was on the other bill? Yes, it was Curse of the Voodoo. Oh, okay. But by the time the second horrible movie comes on, you're probably just done. (laughs) But I imagine that a lot of times when I see these like bad movies from the 50s and 60s, I think, yeah, sure, this is bad, but you probably paid to see two movies. Right. So that makes a movie less bad. 
It's like, sure, there are two bad movies, but hey, you're seeing two movies. <laughs> so that's that already makes it a little bit better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> rather go see two bad movies than like one serious one. Yeah. And and the the it was an android, it was a robot in Frankenstein meets the space monster, an android named Frank Saunders. Mm-hmm. And then he he that's why they called him Frankenstein cuz he it was Frank. Yes. And then Maybe and... Stein because he converted to Judaism or something like <laughs> off of, off a screen. And and we had the Pathmark guy. I I can't think of his name offhand, but he was the one who was in a Return of the Living Dead. Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. Can't come up with his name right now. Uh. He was the one in Return of the Living Dead who brought the young guy down and showed him the tanks and okay. smacked it, which let the gas come out. Yeah. 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 The one who eventually cremated himself. Yeah. So we had him in Frankenstein versus the Space Monster. Probably the only time in his career that somebody would say he was the best part of that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that was Return of the Living Dead was like in Kentucky. Yes. That was another uh-huh. thing I remember about the Return of the Living Dead. Like you don't see a lot of horror movies set in Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, it also opened with based on a true story. Oh, yeah. Like, Which was like, really? Uh, how far are you stretching that phrase? <laughs> I loved the idea. I loved the idea of Return of the Living Dead. Like the original Night of the Living Dead was actually almost like a documentary of what happened. We're going to treat that as if it as if it was real. Right. You know? I I respected that. I I find it I find it interesting. I find it because what had happened there is that there was a schism. There was a fight between John Russo and George Romero over okay. the rights to the storyline basically and because we had the original night of the living dead and then from there going with george romero it was dawn of the dead day of the dead and that's kind of how it broke out that if romero is making a movie then it's just the dead that's what he got the rights to and if john russo is making a movie then it is the living dead. Okay. I gotcha. So that's I, where he came out with the series of Return of the Living Dead, two, three, four, five, six. Only the first one is worth anything, really. Yeah. I think I saw that in the theater. Return of the Living Dead. Pretty sure I did. I caught that one on cable, I, and I had heard nothing about it. It and it just sort of came on one day, and I was watching, and I was like, "Okay, that was pretty awesome." Oh no, I liked Return of the Living Dead. That is, all of those Living Dead movies were ones that played on cable all of the time, mm-hmm. like all of the time. Yeah. Hey, I've got homework for next week. I'll play this. Okay, what do you got? Um, it was homework that I came up with. I came up with the idea for this homework about halfway through this podcast. Okay. Because you, we were talking about Bride of Frankenstein, and you had mentioned about how you were kind of, sort of, quasi-religious, and the opening of Bride of Frankenstein was kind of, like, shocking to you. Yes. And I was trying to think of, my family was quasi, sort of, kind of, semi-religious, too. Like, I was the religious one, but then my parents weren't really that religious. I mean, they never went to church or anything like that, but they, right. if you asked them, they would have said that they were religious. Right, neither did we. We didn't go to church or anything like that. Yeah, but there were still certain things that would happen. Like, if someone lost a job, then there would be some bizarre saint like, there's an app for that. Like, oh, <laughs> I lost a job. Oh, well, there's a saint for that. So, 
And it, there would be candles and praying and, and things like that. And another thing that I remember as a child is that uh, if you sing Stairway to Heaven backwards, right, that's like the worst thing you can do. Because Stairway to Heaven backwards was like a this big, like, satanic song. Right. So, a, like, that was the worst thing. I, I never heard of singing it backwards, but playing it backwards, yes. Yeah. So, um, there's this video that exists. It's hard to find, but I found a link for it, and I sent it to your Facebook Messenger. And this is going to be the homework. This French man um, learned how to sing Stairway to Heaven backwards. Then he recorded himself in front of, like, St. Peter's Basilica. Okay. He recorded himself singing the song backwards. And then he reversed that video. Put music to it. And it looks like him perfectly singing the song Stairway to Heaven, except it's backwards. <laughs> Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of. Yeah, kind of like the, the Twin Peaks midget. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's singing the song perfectly, but everything behind him, everything is going backwards. <laughs> because he's singing the song backwards, and they're reversing that backwards. But it really is an amazing thing to watch. It's quite an impressive feat to watch someone do. And... Uh, it was on YouTube for a while, but then they took it off. But I, I found a link for it, and I sent it to you. And that is the homework. Stairway to Heaven Backwards. I will get that up on our page so Boom. everybody can go check it out. And you want to do four rooms next week? Yes, I absolutely want to do four rooms. I love that movie. And it is, I've been talking to a lot of people because I know some people that, you know, that, are, that are in film school. Right. And, uh, you know, taking all these classes and stuff. And I'm surprised at how many people out there don't know this movie and aren't as obsessed with it as I am. Because <laughs> this is a wonderful film. Four different directors write and direct four different scenes, all centered in the same hotel and featuring the same bellboy character. Yes. It's an amazing, amazing movie. the The first room kind of drags. The second movie is the second room is amazing. The third room is the best, and the fourth room is some of the best work Quentin Tarantino has done. Yeah. Next to Inglorious Bastards, it's amazing, mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful film. And it's just everyone should watch it. Okay. And so it is, it is will... also it's also it, it's also a movie I want to watch because right now. Robert Rodriguez has his own cable TV station. El Rey. Uh -huh. El Rey. And uh, I have become obsessed with his wrestling show. Really? Yes. It is amazing. I'm obsessed with it. I've gotten my kids obsessed with it. Maxwell. Maxwell, do you like Prince Puma? I like Prince Puma. Prince Puma rocks. M Maxwell, say I like Prince Puma. I like Prince Puma. Yeah. I like Prince Puma. Yeah. My kids <laughs> love Lucha Underground. It is amazing. So I want to talk about that too. So I figure that watching Four Rooms would be a good like opening to talk about these different these different directors and the things that they've done. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And it sounds like we're kind of winding up anyway, huh? Yeah, my kids are going nuts. <laughs> okay. No, no, sorry. My kids are driving me nuts. Aha. Uh -huh. Is what I meant to say there. There is a bit of a difference there. Quite a difference. So this is the Pope on film, and we are back. Yes, um, we are back. And we will keep it as regular as we can unless strange emergencies come up. But you can find us on Facebook. Do a search for Pope on film. Like our page. Uh, you can email us at pope at undeadcow.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Pope on Film or on YouTube at Undead Cow Films. You can also check out our feed burner so to, to burn feeds. <laughs> and it's so funny because my wife, 
my wife just a couple of days ago. I thought of you because my wife was just she was just fooling around on the internet because we got the internet back and, and um, it's funny because we hadn't had the internet for like months because we were struggling with bills and stuff right. so once once we got the internet back I forgot how to internet Ooh, because it had been so long it's like what websites did I go to what do I see we have Netflix back what do I watch I don't know what to watch I haven't watched <laughs> Netflix since we got the internet back because I don't know what to do like what do I do the only thing I've seen on Netflix is a 20 minute long documentary on the history of the Lego Corporation and I just can't get myself to watch anything else I think it's also like fear because my wife just started watching The Walking Dead and uh -huh. it's it has consumed her entire life uh-huh, okay. She just, every second of her life has to be spent now watching The Walking Dead, and just, she's obsessed with it, and I just, I look at Netflix, and I go, I kind of want to watch that, but <laughs> I don't want to become a druggie for that, you know? It's a good show. You should check it out. I know, but, I, like, I want, I want something that I can watch and then stop watching. Yeah. I don't I don't want something that I watch and then go, okay, well, I'll have to binge watch this now for the next week. <laughs> I just want something on that I don't have to think about too hard about. You know, just something in the background. And so I so my wife was messing around on the internet the other day and she's like, "What is this?" And and I said, "What are you talking about?" And she said, "Well, I, you know, I Hey, I'm just messing around here, and somebody mentioned this website. What the hell is Stitcher? <laughs> and I, I, I turned towards her, and I said, Honey, you obviously never listen to the podcast, but let me, let me tell you something. My whole life has been me waiting for you to ask this question. <laughs> let me explain to you, honey what a stitcher is <laughs> it was just it was just it was it was gold it was gold yeah. absolutely gold but i could tell her what a stitcher is because we have a stitcher and you should check out our stitcher please check out our stitcher and yeah. tell us what it really does <laughs> it's a facebook for knitters i think it's something like that yeah it's it's like Twitter, but for people who get a lot of stitches <laughs> because they injure themselves a lot, like Johnny Knoxville jackass types. Yes. Yeah. Ex extreme knitting. Yeah. Extreme knitting. Yeah. Extriting. Extriting. <laughs> is what it is. That's, that's what it's called on the streets. That's what the cool, that's what the cool kids are calling it. So again, if you're going to put a clip of audio before the episode, really go with the Leva. The Leva. The Leva. Bella, say it. The Leva. Good job. <laughs> the Leva. I will see if I'm going to be able to pull that. Sweet. Shouldn't be too hard. Nah. <laughs> I love the Leva. Wait, wait, wait. Say it again, Maxwell. Oliva. Good job, Maxwell. Oliva. Good job. I'm going to get you a muffin basket. What is a muffin basket? What is a muffin basket, Bella? It's a basket filled with muffins. I want a muffin basket. You're not getting a muffin basket because you're a furball. You're a furball. I am a furball. I'm proud of it. <laughs> I'm proud of it. Furballs and Levi's. Furballs and Levi's. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's spelled L E E dash V A H exclamation point. That's how you spell that. The Leva. Max, come over here. Well, uh, for the Pope on film, I'm Bunny Williams. And I am the Reverend Steve Galindo. So until next week. The Leva! The Leva! <laughs> Thank you, kids. Thank you, kids, for that final Leva. <laughs> so until next week, uh, uh, good night and God bless. <laughs> I decided to go with something different this time. See you next week. Cut Bye. and print. Cut. <laughs> All right. Cut and print.
Cut and print. Cut and print. Cut and print. Cut and print. So there, there we go. We've we've done another one. Yay! And this is like I'm so glad you're feeling better. Oh, thank you. And this is like 17 or something like that, I think. Yeah, something like that. This yeah. is a good one. This yeah. is a good one. Yeah, it was a good one. Uh, let me go though, because Jeannie got home while we were recording. Yes. So I want to say hi to her and stuff like that. And we'll figure out a time next week to do four rooms. Yes. I've got my schedule already, so I'll text you. Okay, excellent. Cool. I'll All right, talk man. To you later. Be good. Bye. 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 Bye.